want to first thank you, uh, thank all the organizers for this opportunity to be here, to be part of this very exciting uh, sleep uh, conferences, uh, first of its kind, so it's very exciting. So um, I want to start out by saying that um, actually, I think that our goal, long-term goal, is really try to get a better understanding of um, what does optimum sleep means for human at the molecular uh, mechanism level. That's what we, we really, really are interested in. So our team, this is the approach that we have been using for our last more than 20 years, like Louis said uh, this morning, that we always started out by human subjects with interesting uh, sleep behaviors. And then we use their DNA to find their mutation um, that are responsible for whatever sleep uh, traits they have. And then when we find the mutation, we then uh, carry out uh, molecular studies and also use animal models. And in recent years, we mostly use uh, mouse models. And it's our hope that someday we will use everything we learn to help us understand uh, how sleep, human sleep is regulated and maybe uh, we can better uh, help regulate sleep. And so I think several speakers have talked about this, but maybe not in a two-process model uh, term, but people have talked about uh, circadian rhythm and sleep pressure, two processes. And this uh, was a, a model that proposed by uh, Bobley in 1982 uh, to help uh, describe sleep uh, behavior. So there is this circadian rhythm and there is this uh, sleep homeostasis. And I want to come back to this two-process model uh, later in my talk. So um, our group, uh, as Louis say, that we, um, as a whole, we're interested in two, only two aspects of human sleep, of course, because human sleep behavior is so complex, right? So we're only interested in uh, sleep schedule and sleep duration. And sleep schedule is really about what is the best time for you to go to bed and what is the best time for you to get up. That's about sleep schedule. And a lot of that is regulated by circadian rhythm. And the other aspect is about sleep duration, which is about how many hours of sleep actually will be best for you uh, to get. So uh, about 2005, we found a mutation in a gene called DAC2. And from, uh, from people actually are morning larks. They were our participants that they, they told us they are morning larks. When we find their mutation, we went back to talk to these people and realized that these people actually, they get up early, but they don't go to bed early. So they don't fall into the, the group of people that we call them uh, morning larks because if they're morning larks, they also go to bed early. And so this family, the people in this family, actually they go to bed at the, about the same time with the, uh, most of people. So we realized that these people actually actually are not morning larks, they are uh, short sleepers, they just don't need as much sleep. And we published this paper in 2009. And of course, at that time, we had no idea, you know, this was like only this family, extremely rare, or maybe there was nobody else in the whole world uh, like this. But we published a paper, and it, it was reported in a lot of newspaper, and we got a lot of people who came to us, uh, told us that they are nature short sleepers. And so after several years, um, we now have quite a bit of a collection. But I want here, I just want to show you uh, the activity recording for one of the first, um, the, the DAC2 family people. And you can see that this person on average sleep six hours uh, a day. So um, we now have uh, quite a, a large number, but large is all relative, quite a, a few number, about 100 people uh, in the nature of short sleepers. And then we have st um, studied many of them. And now we feel that a, a lot of these nature of short sleepers, we call them nature of short sleepers, uh, to distinguish the, 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 the other type is, we call them habitual short sleeper. Habitual short sleepers are people who train themselves to be short sleepers. They, they are probably not genetically wired to be uh, short sleepers. So we have looked at many of these people, and most of them have this trace. They're very optimistic and enthusiastic. They're very active, and they're multi, very good multitaskers. They usually have more than one job, or they go to school full time, and then they, on the side, they have some one or two jobs at the same time. Also, a lot of them have very high pain threshold. And uh, another common thing that they say is that they don't experience jet lag when they travel. And so, um, Another thing that I didn't put on there because I want to be uh, more conserv conservative like Louis say that another um, common thing that we see is that a lot of these people actually live a, a full life. Um, 
90s or, uh, or above. And we, all I can say is so far we have not found any major disease or any obvious problem come with these uh, nature shore sleepers. So at some point, uh, we realized that if we study the nature shore sleepers, it can help us understand how our sleep duration is regulated, how many hours is opti uh, sleep is optimum for us. But at the same time, we also realized that actually this could also provide us an opportunity to understand sleep efficiency. And why do I say that is that we think now that um, whatever sleep function is, we, we have heard many people talk about sleep function. Regardless, it doesn't matter what the sleep function is. For most of us, it requires eight hours to do it, right? We need eight hours in order to feel good, to, to be healthy and live a long life. But for these people, only take four to six hours and they can live a full long life. In other words, whatever the function sleep is doing for them is more efficient than the rest of us. So by studying these nature short sleepers, maybe it will also provide us an opportunity to understand how sleep efficiency is regulated. So um, we have three genes, and so far three genes published, and today I just want to focus on one, uh, one story, and that's because what we do with each gene, it really depends on what gene it is. So it could be very different, and I think it would be good for me to just focus on one gene. And so 10 years after we published the first uh, mutation, we published the second mutation um, that was identified in the gene called ADRB1. It encodes for adrenergic receptor beta-1. And this project was done uh, by uh, Guang Shen Shi, and he's here today, a very outstanding uh, poster. And so the mutation was found in this medium-sized family with uh, many people have the mutation and also short sleepers, including one of them actually is more uh, flexible. He can sleep short or he can sleep long, uh, depending on his mood, I guess. <laughs> he can do whatever he wants. <laughs> so the short sleeper uh, in this family on average sleep uh, 5.7 hours um, a day and uh, non-mutation carriers sleep 7.9 hours a day. So it's about 2.2 hours difference uh, for this family. Now, ADLB1's uh, crystal structure actually was solved many years ago. So, of course, we, we looked at it and, and, and realized that the mutation is not likely going to change its binding activity with the, the agonist, but it's more likely to be involved in uh, its binding with the uh, membrane lipid. And so, um, Guangsheng found that uh, the mutant protein actually is less stable uh, than the wild type protein here with the in vitro. Um, uh, pulse chase experiment and the, the mouse model, both he found that the, the mutant protein is less stable uh, than the wild type protein. And we also found that if we mixed half of the wild type and half of the mutant protein together and test the cyclic AMP production, um, see what happened. Um, this is because the uh, ADLB1 is a GS coupled GPCR. So when we mix half of the wild type and half the mutant, we found that actually it produced less cyclic AMP than the wild type alone, suggesting that the mutation probably has functional consequences. So um, th those experiments were done before we made the mouse model. So we, uh, from those data, we then made the uh, CRISPR mouse models. And with the CRISPR mouse model, we first uh, used the animates uh, to look at their sleep uh, features. So animates is a, a video recording, infrared re video recording. And with the, with the animates, we found that the mutant in green here, the mutant sleep less than the wild type in black here, and especially in the dark face. And then again, of course, it, they spend more time awake uh, than the wild type. But in the mammalian system, uh, the EEG is the gold standard. So we then uh, follow up with the EEG. And we found that when we did the EEG, the mutant uh, mice on average sleep 55 minutes shorter than the wild type mice uh, every day. And this is just plotting my uh, 24 hours, and this is by plotting my uh, hourly. And the, the, the shorter sleep is mostly um, in the dark phase. Uh, for ADRB1, and I want to emphasize here because every mutation is different. So for ADRB1, it's in the dark phase, and the different mutation maybe is in, in both light and dark phase. Now, um, if we look at the, the REM and non-REM uh, uh, bow length and bow number, we found that actually both the REM and non-REM bow length didn't change, but the bow number actually both changed. So this mice, the mutant mice sleep less, uh, is because they have a fewer sleep bowel, and the bowel length actually didn't change. 
So um, for this short sleep human or mice, there are two possibilities, or at least when we were thinking about it, there were two possibilities that this could happen. One is that this, um, People who are short sleeper or mutant mice, they just don't accumulate as much sleep pressure so they can stay awake longer. The other possibility is that they also can accumulate sleep pressure just like the rest of us, but for some reason their body can sustain higher sleep pressure. So to distinguish these two possibilities, we uh, look at their uh, delta power, uh, use delta power as the sleep pressure index. And we found that the mutant at the end of the dark phase, in other words, at the end of their active phase, they do have higher sleep pressure than the wild type mice. In other words, the mutant mice and probably human, they do accumulate sleep pressure, but for some reason their body can sustain higher sleep pressure than, than the rest of us. Now here, next few minutes, I want to just uh, talk briefly about the, the third mutation we found because there's a point I want to make here. So the first, the third mutation we found is in this gene called NPSR1. And this project was uh, done by a postdoc, another very outstanding postdoc, uh, Li Juanxing here. And the NPSR1 is in code for NPS receptor one. So for the mouse, uh, the mouse model with animates, the infrared uh, video recording, again, this mutant mice, uh, uh, this red, here we are looking at the wake time. So the mutant mice spend much more time awake than the wild type uh, mice. And if we look at the, uh, the EEG here, um, the, the mutant mice actually, um, on average, sleep 71 minutes shorter than the wild type mice uh, every 24 hours. And here, um, for the NPSR1, you can see the difference in both light and dark phase. And that's why I was saying that uh, this, the, whether it's the light phase or dark phase, uh, it depends on the mutation. And we, uh, we, we're still trying to collect data with all the mutations that we find. And hopefully, we will be able to um, have some, uh, find some consistent uh, uh, trend there. But um, so here I want to show you. Um, uh, so REM and non-REM again because sleep less. So REM and non-REM also is reduced. Uh, uh, not surprising because we know that, that their sleep is reduced. Now here um, again, just like ADRB1, we found that their bowel number is reduced. REM and non-REM bowel number is reduced, but the bowel length didn't change. So for the both mutations, we found that the, they sleep less because they, sleep, they have reduced sleep bowel, and the bowel length actually didn't change. Now again, for the NPSR1, we found that the mutant at the end of the dark, uh, dark phase, in other words, at the end of their active phase, the mutant has higher delta power than the wild type uh, mice. So for both ADRB1 and NPSR1, we found that the mutant mice and probably human, they can sustain higher sleep pressure than, um, than the wild type uh, mice. Or I think these people probably similarly, they can sustain higher sleep pressure than, than the rest of us. But if we look at the, um, uh, after sleep deprivation, we look at their sleep uh, rebound, we found that their sleep rebound is normal. So here I want to make a point here is that according to the uh, Bobley's two process model, and that's the, the model that um, almost everybody is using in, in the sleep field, that there are these two processes that uh, together uh, regulate our sleep. One is circadian rhythm and one is sleep pressure. And for the 15, 15 years that we have been doing this, Louis and Chris Jones, uh, one of our uh, previous collaborators, always say that um, there is probably going to be more than two process um, in, in regulating our sleep uh, behavior. And they always talk about the behavior drive probably is one of them. And I think that for from our ADRB1 and NPSR1 mutation, they actually um, kind of uh, prove this point or demonstrate this point very nicely that these people, even though they can, they, they have have higher sleep pressure than the rest of us, they can still stay awake and stay awake longer. And it's probably because they have uh, activated behavior drive and not because their circadian rhythm. I think their circadian rhythm is normal and their sleep pressure process is likely to be mostly uh, normal. So they, they have this activated behavior drive. So there will be, a, uh, uh, I call it two process plus one, at least three process together to regulate sleep. So I want to come back to ADRB1 story. So uh, Guangxin uh, wanted to, um, to look into how ADRB1 neuron is, uh, 
can participate in sleep regulation. So to, to study that, he first had to make a, a ADRB1 cream mice, and he made a back ADRB1 cream mice. Then he crossed onto two different reported mice here. And from both reported mice, he found very similar things that ADRB1 actually is widely expressed in different parts of the brain, uh, but including a region called dorsal pounds. And dorsal pound is a region that previously people have uh, indicated that it might have, uh, it, it's participating in sleep regulation. So he thought that uh, dorsal pounding region will be a good place for him to start. But before he uh, dive into dorsal pound region, he did three experiments to help him feel better or confirm this is a good place to start. So first thing he did was that he used a trap uh, methods to pull down actively translated uh, messenger RNA from ribosomes and then, and, and check the ADRB1's expression and confirm that ADRB1's expression in the dorsal pound region indeed is much higher than a lot of control genes. And the second thing he did was by injecting AAV uh, virus uh, encoding EGFP into dorsal pounding and then use in situ probe uh, for ADRB1 and what he found was that more than 80% of the neurons actually co-expressed co EGFP and ADRB1. They and whether it's a... Suggests that this Cree line uh, is a very good Cree line to represent ADRB1 expression. The third thing he did was to look at the projection from dorsal pound uh, to different parts of the brain. And he found that two regions have high um, expression. One is basal forebrain and the other is lateral hypothalamus. And that both of these are regions that people have indicated in participating in sleep regulation. So all these three things help him uh, feel uh, good about dorsal pounding. So um, the first question then he wanted to address was how does ADRB1 neurons activity correlate with sleep and wake? So he decided to use uh, uh, fiber photometry and to record the um, calcium activity and the EEG simultaneously. Here he used the probe. He put the um, optic fiber probe and EEG electrode into same mouse so he can record the brain uh, neuron activity with the uh, sleep uh, simultaneously. Now if we zoom in the sleep-wake state transition here, you see that the, the neuronal activity is lower in the non-REM and higher in the REM and lower on the non-REM again and higher in the wake. And this is, if we zoom in in the state transition for one mouse, now if we zoom out to look at longer recording for one mouse, and you can see that here in yellow is wake and red is REM and blue is uh, non-REM, you can see all this calcium activity coincide very nicely with the wake and REM sleep and there's the, the ADRB1 neuron is very quiet uh, during non-REM. And this is a zoom out for one mouse, and of course he did this for many mice and confirmed that the ADRB1 neuron um, is active during wake and REM, but is uh, quiet during non-REM. Now, so the next question he wanted to see is if, if he stimulate the ADRB1 neurons in the dorsal pounding region, would it change the sleep-wake state? So this, he decided to use uh, optogenetic. Uh, and again, he, um, he put the probe, optic fiber probe, and EEG electrode onto the same mouse so he can record this, uh, the sleep and the, um, the calcium activity simultaneously. Now the top panel here is the channel rhodopsin, the experimental mice, and the, the below is the uh, YFP, is the control. And so here the red boxes are when he stimulated these mice or gave them a short light pause and you see the control has no change. Now if he gave the light at the REM or wake, it actually didn't change their sleep-wake state. But if the light was given during non-REM, it can almost instantaneously wake this mouse up. So here again, if we look at the data in, in this view, it will be uh, easier to see that the light can instantaneously wake the mouse up. Uh, from the non-REM, but not much for REM and wake. And this is probably because the ADRB1 neurons are already active during REM and wake. And so if you stimulate them more, it's not going to uh, make them change their sleep-wake state. So at that point, we knew that ADRB1 neuron uh, activity is associated with wake and, and, and REM, but how does the mutation affect ADRB1 neurons activity? And so he, to answer that question, he then crossed the ADRB1 Cree mice with ADRB1 mutant mice to generate ADRB1 Cree wild type and ADRB1 Cree mutant mice. And he decided to use uh, fiber photometry to look at this. 
Now, fiber photometry, actually, it's very difficult to compare fiber photometry from different mice. So he decided to record the same mouse uh, during light phase and, and dark phase both. And because light phase, the mouse is uh, mostly sleeping, so he will use the, the light phase uh, as a baseline for the same mouse for the uh, dark phase. And so after he did for many mice, um, he found that the, actually the, the mutant mice ADRB1 neuron activity is much higher than the wild type mice. <clears throat> So to answer the, the question of whether the, the, the increased activity of the ADRB1 neuron is the cell autonomous or a secondary effect, he decided to use a single cell uh, calcium image. And here I'm just going to uh, uh, quickly uh, point out that actually there are three types of neurons um, he found. One type is inhibited by dobutamine, which is a specific agonist, and the other type is unchanged, and third type is activated. And what he found is the type that can be inhibited, the, the, the number of the neuron is significantly decreased in the mutant mice. And this is consistent with what we saw that the, the mutant mice, actually the neuron has higher activity. And because of the time, I'm just going to, <laughs> I think that's a good place to, to stop here. So um, I, I just want to, uh, again, say that actually um, our group, what we're doing is by using human genetics uh, as a tool to help us um, uh, try to get a better understanding of how our sleep is regulated in, in both sleep uh, schedule and sleep duration. But I think that the, the Nature Short Sleeper also provides us a very unique opportunity that probably can help us understand how our sleep efficiency can be regulated. And I want to thank people who actually did the work. Uh, like Max do say, I said, I only drink tea and stay in my office. <laughs> so people who uh, actually did the work are all here. Uh, Guangshen and Li Jun are in, in, um, at this meeting. And Jiang and Nick are two graduate students, also work on the uh, sleep uh, project. And they are also here at the meeting. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Time for questions. I'm not sure if I got confused about um, what you're saying, but I thought that um, the ADRB1, right, it's, it's supposed to be excitatory, right? It's excited by noradrenaline, right? Yeah, so... Explain the fact, and, and then the mutant is actually loss of function, if I understand. So how do you explain <laughs> the fact that in mutants, these neurons actually have higher activity? That in the mutant, it has reduced... So actually, it, people have shown this. We, we didn't find this. Uh, the AD, the ADRB1 is both inhibitory and excitatory, actually. So people have shown that we didn't. And what we found is that actually the number of the inhibitory neuron decreased. And therefore, when we look at the, the mouse, uh, the, the activity, neuron activity actually is increased. It's because the inhibitory type, for some reason, inhibitory type um, is decreased. The, the, the number of the cell neuron is decreased. I mean, the, the response yeah. to adrenaline, that should be excitation, right? Yeah. Or is that also mixed? The response to adrenaline yeah. is, um, I don't know. Guangxin, do you know? Not yeah, not necessary. <laughs> we don't, yeah, so. I didn't quite understand your sleep pressure re results. So the short sleepers, if they, a, a deprivation of one hour, for example, would represent a higher fraction of their total sleep, but you, you seem to see, show they recovered with normal sleepers at the same rate. So if they- You mean the, the, the delta power? Short sleepers, uh, there was a graph that came up. And yes, yes. My, yeah. Do you expect them to maybe recover faster? Well, so, you know, if you remember the figure, I, so I'm very, I want to be careful because the reviewer were <laughs> <laughs> very upset about, you know, <laughs> How we say? Okay, let me let me see. So there are people who, you know, of course, understand this much more than uh, we do. And so, if you see that this one, it feels like they recover fast. Is this a figure you are talking about, right? It feels like they, they are higher and they go to the baseline at, uh, at the same time, so I feel like they are recovering faster. Get, Is that what you're saying? They get sleep pressure at the same rate as a normal person? They, they, well, we don't know if the rate is the same, but at least at the end of the active phase, their sleep pressure is higher than ours. 
and you measure sleep pressure. I, I thought sleep pressure is measured by how they recover. Is, oh, no. Is sleep like, pressure is, no. Sleep pressure is, is oh, it's not how it recovers. Yeah. Explain, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, so I thought that would recover faster, but um, some reviewer didn't like that, so I, I, don't, I want to <laughs> be careful what I say. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I like the concept of the behavioral drive. Yes. It has been, uh, you know, we, we do have, I mean, it's very well known, uh, actually, clinically. Right, 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 right. Maybe sleep a very long time, but with very shallow sleep, because they don't have a very strong resistance to find Wake them sleep. up. And, and also, you know, we have different tests where we measure uh, sleep propensity. In the right, clinic. right. One of them is we ask people to go into a dark room and how fast right. they fall asleep. Yes. And then we have others, we put them, this is called an MSLT, and mm -hmm. also we put them in a dark room and right. ask them to stay awake right. Right. and try to fight, you know. Right. And, and right. the results are actually very highly correlated, but not perfectly correlated. Yeah. So I think, indeed, there are people who... It's a difference between sleepability, which is how easy it is to go yeah. to sleep, versus yeah. how easy it is to resist sleep deprivation. Right. And these two yes, things are yes. slightly different. Yeah. And I, I, yeah. The behavioral drive. And I find that these short sleepers are very interesting because they, they always tell me they, 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 they fall, they, their head hits the pillow and they fall asleep. They sleep very well. 